so relentless, I am one by perfect love, better than arms of heaven, and a peace that lasts forever, Satan did, and mercy sees, I'm wide awake, drawing close. By grace and oh, my heart is yours. I feel removed. I breathe you in. I lean into your love. Your love, your You pursue me in my head to see your glory, Lord of oh, all. So beautiful. Here in you, I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face. My secret place, I'm wide awake. Drawing closer by grace, no, my heart is yours. All fear and I breathe you in, lead into your So deep is washing over me. Your face is all I see. You are my everything. And Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. Lord, hear my only cry to know you all my life. Your love so deep is washing. Jesus.
Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. Lord, hear my only cry to know you. Oh, help me out. Your love, your love so deep is washing over me. Your face is all I see. You are my everything. Oh, Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. Lord, hear my only cry to know you. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, looks like a full crowd. But today, um, we are from the Rolling Heights, Trinity, whatever, um, Filipino service. So my name is JR, this is James on the electric, Aaron on the bass, and Ronrick from the back on the drums. So um, it is an honor to lead worship with you guys today. And you know what, no matter what, two or three are gathered in the house, Jesus is with us. God is in our presence right now, and let's pray for those who are not here, the ladies, the, the women's ministry, for those who are out having vacation, and um, just taking a break. But right now, um, let's just give it all to God, amen? So we're going to sing a few energetic songs, and I hope you guys keep up, but this is all for the Lord. This song's called One Way.
turn to you and you're always there In trouble times, in trouble times it's you I see I put you first, that's all I need I humble all I am, all to you Whoa, wait. One, two, three, go! 
Jesus will live for your name Never be ashamed of you Our praise and all we are to do Take, take, take it all Round of applause, and they got to go to kids' service. Good morning. <laughs> oh, hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Jeff. I. I'm the administrator here at the Murray Park campus, and as you can tell, we have a smaller crowd today. That's because 60 women between our two campuses um, are on a women's retreat today, and so we have a little smaller crowd. Um, if you're new with us, you find in your bulletin, you'll have a connection card, and if you fill out the connection card and you're new, we have a kiosk right outside in the courtyard. You can fill that out, get a free t-shirt and an awesome USB drive as well. We also have coming up a few opportunities, and most of our opportunities fall within one of three categories or any of the mixture of the three categories. That is, our mission, our um, motto is to love God, love people, and change the world. And so what that means is that um, our events usually follow one or two or all three of these patterns. And the first one is fellowshipping, and that's kind of um, loving people, right? This, the first one is loving God, which is kind of like Bible studies and, and groups and such like that. And then changing the world is our missions arm of the church, right? And so these things will fall into one of those three categories. And those are just great opportunities for you to dive into either the word or with each other in terms of fellowship and support or just kind of changing the world for the better, right? And so Hands of Mercy is actually one of those opportunities to change the world for the better. We get to build a house on our Roland Heights campus. If you don't know where that is, it's actually on our, the back of your bulletin. There's a dress there. And it's going to be happening on November 11th on the Roland Heights campus from about 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m. And if you want more information about that or like who can participate, they actually, it's actually uh, available for the entire family. Right on the back of your connection card and we can get you more information about that on November 11th, all right? Next, we also have our Thanksgiving potluck. Again, this is for our fellowship with each other. There, is, um, there was a sign-up sheet going around last week. If you want more information about that or you want to help out and bring something, again, right on your connection card, it's like, hey, Thanksgiving potluck, and then we'll get out and uh, contact you, all right? That'll be here on this campus on November 19th. We also have another opportunity to reach out to our local community. Angel Tree is a way that we can bless um, the kids of the families. No, it's our prison ministry, and we get to um, help the kids that have one or more guardians in the prison system. And what happens is in this prison system, um, we get to donate gifts on their parents' behalf, and we get to kind of spread a little Christmas cheer and joy um, along with spreading the gospel. And we do that because God has kind of blessed us through different people as well, even though people we don't really know. And so this is our chance to do the same thing. And there's going to be a little tree out in the, the foyer here on um, November 19th. And there'll be little, little names that you can grab and actually buy presents for. It'll have like the age, uh, the gender. It could be like five-year-old, I don't know, Christy or something. And you can get a gift for them. And then we can wrap that on the December 8th. And then the party for these actual families and their kids will be on December 9th. Next, we also have Christmas decorating. It's also known as tree trimming. We get to decorate the sanctuary to make it a little more festive. It actually doesn't really fall too much into those three categories unless you want to consider it fellowship as well. There is a light lunch provided afterwards for those who stay and help out on November 26th. And this is to get ready for our kind of our Advent season. All right, so if you want more information about that, again, write it on the connection card and we'll get back to you. And here's our calendar here. We're going to have a communion meal today right after service. Hands of Mercy, Thanksgiving potluck, Angel Tree, all happening there. And then we have a Christmas decorating at the end of November. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Abner. Yeah, we're going to continue in worship this morning. Good morning, Trinity, by the way. 
Um, yeah, we're going to continue worship by uh, giving our tithes and offering. Uh, for those of you who don't make Trinity your home, please don't feel compelled to give. For the rest of us, uh, if Trinity is your home, this is the way that we participate in the advancement of the kingdom of God by uh, contributing uh, what the Lord has given to us and basically just giving it back. Uh, Mo Molly and I have been doing this uh, consistently since we've been married together. And um, I, I always thought, you know, when I wasn't a Christian, that it was a little bit weird that people would give you know, their money to the church. But everything that, uh, that we collect uh, goes right back to the community. So with that, uh, why don't we sing the doxology together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Lord, I lift up, oh, amen. amen. Um, Lord, I lift up uh, the families and the community uh, here at Trinity and in Monterey Park and uh, Roland Heights and San Gabriel Valley, Lord, uh, who know you and who don't know you. God, I pray that you would provide for people. Lord, for those of us who have been blessed right now to have a job and have the means uh, to give, Lord, I pray that we would uh, do that joyfully. Lord, uh, nobody compels us to do this. We do this. Lord, because we love you, and, and we want to see good things happen in this community. Lord, for those who don't have, God, I pray that you would provide jobs. God, that you would uh, give them what they need, Lord, uh, to put food on the table, to pay bills, and to uh, do everything that, that they can, Lord. Um, Lord, would you uh, help the rest of us be generous? And Lord, I pray that as a community, we would come together uh, to worship you and to love you uh, with what we have and what we don't have. God, that we would be uh, together in, in prayer uh, and just tangibly meeting each other's needs. So we thank you and we love you and pray a blessing over these offerings, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we sing, King of my heart. Let the King of my heart be the mountain. Mountain.
So this morning, uh, we're going to hear from Aaron. Uh, some of you guys know him. Uh, Aaron and Tiffany have been at the church for, what, 10 months? Maybe a year now, yeah? And they have a little one, Emily, who was born two and a half, three months ago? Almost three months, yeah. And uh, one thing that you need to know about Aaron, Aaron's sometimes not here on Sunday mornings because he gets a lot of speaking engagements at other churches, but Trinity is his home. Uh, Aaron and I have been connecting. Uh, he just started leading uh, Mark's study on uh, Wednesday nights for the men, so that's been really exciting. One of the things that I love about Aaron, I think, is he has a really deep love for people and a really deep love for theology, right? Like when you sit down with this guy and you, 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 you give him an opportunity to flow, he just kind of starts talking about scripture, making connections all over the place. And I love to talk to people like that, right? Like I love to basically nerd out um, and talking about God. So Aaron's going to uh, bless us. Uh, before he comes up, though, why don't you greet uh, some people around you and that will give Aaron an opportunity just to get situated up here. But Aaron, um, yeah, why don't you come up, and then when we get situated, I'll, I'll pray for you. But why don't you guys say hi to each other real quick. All right, let's go. Um, thank you, guys. Let's, uh, let's pray for Aaron. You get to lead us in that. But let me pray for you. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for our brother Aaron, Lord. Uh, Lord, thank you that, Lord, I just feel like in the last year, year and a half, you brought a lot of people who are either full-time in ministry elsewhere or have, have been in ministry. And I know that Aaron is, is one of those people that loves you and has served you and is currently serving you, Lord, by blessing other ministries, other congregations. And I, I'm so glad, Lord God, that he calls Trinity home. Lord, I love this brother. I love his passion for you. I love that uh, he loves uh, to talk, talk about theology, Lord. He lo he's a, a person who loves truth. And I pray that we would receive from him, Lord. So I pray that as he's speaking today, God, that we would open up our hearts to you. Uh, Lord, for those uh, who are not here today, God, I, I pray that you would bless them. And for those of us who are here, God, that we would be attuned to you. So we love you and we thank you. Amen. Um, <clears throat> to go on. If you would um, say his prayer with me to get started, rise. Um, yeah, please, if you would stand, rise. O oh Lord our God, you have chosen to make yourself known through your creation, your word, your son, and your spirit. You now reveal your glory to us and through us, the church. Speak to us, form us, lead us, dwell in us. Teach us today how to love as Jesus loves, to welcome the stranger, heal the sick, and care for the poor, to bear good news, build bridges, 
and bring your people home. For Christ in us is the hope of glory. May your perfect will prevail in us this day. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. There we go. First off, I want to say thank you to the leadership, um, specifically Albert, who's not even here, um, who actually I've been able to meet with quite a bit and chat with, and he, um, through conversation, knows of my history of being a pastor and teaching and so on and so forth. Um, for those of you that see my phone also really quick, I promise you I'm not texting, I'm using my notes on here, um, which is... Um, hopefully not too distracting for anybody. But through meeting and talking with him, he approached me and said, hey, I want you to speak eventually at Trinity, and we want to get a teaching team, through which Abner and Molly have become part of, and him and Christine and Johnny, and eventually I would imagine others. But I just want to say thank you. So Albert will eventually see this, so that's why I'm saying thank you. Um, but the sermon series we're going through is today is the day. And I specifically want to touch on the resurrection of Christ, that we are risen with Christ. That the resurrection is not some big thought, thought lofty idea, theological idea, which it's great and it is foundational, and I'll touch on that, but it's more than just that. It's more than just the, this cognitive thought that we have, that we believe, that we talk about, that we preach, and that we must believe because of who Christ says he is. But the passage specifically that we're, we're using as kind of the foundation that Christine talked about last week is uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's why this today's the day, because there's this urgency that Paul is giving from this passage. And I want to talk about real quick human skin. This is actually a picture of somebody with Lyme's disease on their hands. Um, but the human skin is really cool. And I picked a skin, a picture that, that, is, that is not pretty, because it's not the perfect looking hands. It's not going to be one you're going to see on one of those moisturizer commercials. But the hands are, are very they kind of look like they're beat up a little bit. They look like the hands of a construction worker in a way. But the skin is, is very self-sustaining. It regenerates itself. We have new skin cells that replace old ones. The dead skin cells are on the top and the new fresh skin cells are under the bottom. New skin cells form at the bottom. The skin all skin cells, excuse me, are different shape. The, the human skin is very different. It's, 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 it's a different aspect of the organ, and it's also one of the biggest organs that we have. It is, it is the biggest organ that we have. On one inch of skin, and I, this is me geeking out just a little bit more, and I geek out on more than just theology. I'm a nutrition nerd also, and a running nerd also. But on one inch of your skin, you have about 650 sweat glands. For those of you that exercise and you sweat, you now see why you sweat so much. You have 20, about 20 blood vessels. You have 60,000 microlit, microlits, excuse me on the pro pronunciation, but it's basically the, skin, the thing that gives your skin color. And you have a thousand or more nerve endings, which is why our skin is so sensitive. But the importance of skin in any human organ, in any part of the human body, is if you don't feed it, it will die. But what you feed it matters just as much. What are you putting in it? What are you putting in your stomach to then feed your body to help your body grow? to help your body change and help your body become what it should be. If you're trying to, to lift weights and become stronger, you eat more protein-oriented meals. 
If you're trying to get leaner, you eat leaner meats, you eat a lot of rice, you eat a lot of vegetables because you want leaner muscles. And I could go into a whole big detail of that, but some, only a few of you would really, really find that exciting. The rest of you would probably just glaze over and it would not be helpful. But the point being is depending on how you grow your body or how you want to grow your body, you eat certain things. And if you want to, um, in all honesty, treat your body very bad, you go to McDonald's or Taco Bell. Because if you've watched studies on it like I have, you kind of don't go there <laughs> because you know what's going on. And I've worked in a lot of those businesses growing up and then also um, as a full-grown adult, but also as a teenager, I worked at uh, McDonald's. But what do you put in your body? Because what you put in your body ultimately affects the rest of your body, what you put in your stomach, what you eat. Are you caring for your body? Now this takes time and discipline, and it takes more than knowledge. It actually takes action. I actually have to stop myself sometimes from eating an extra slice of pizza. Those that go to the couple, that are part of the couple group I go to every other Sunday night know that I'm always at the end of the group grabbing an extra slice of pizza. Wes can attest to that. He's probably grabbed a slice of pizza himself, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I asked him one time to give me a couple slices. He sent me home with like six or seven. I wanted two. <laughs> he tried to send me home with the whole pizza, actually. But physically, this is very important. But spiritually, we feed upon theological thoughts and truths. And theologically, you must understand how Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that your fathers ate manna in the desert. And just as they did that, that manna, it was not consistent. It was not the substance. It was a picture of Christ who says, I am the bread of life. And he who believes in me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. There is this spiritual understanding, this pictorial aspect of Christ being bread, of Christ being food. And as we kind of move from the skin and some guy's really dirty, ugly hands, we see that the resurrection is very important. It is pivotal to what we believe. It is very pivotal. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, worthless, and you are still in your sins. If Jesus Christ died on the cross and only died on the cross, our faith is worthless. We're wasting our time. My 15 years of belief and walking and trying and studying and all the things I've done are in vain. It's like running a race or training to run a race. And in going and running the race, and you get to the end, and there's actually no line, and everybody's disappeared. That's kind of the mentality in the picture that you're given here, is that you've done all this, and all this is true, and you think all this, but Jesus is just really some dead guy. He's just some guy that died on the cross. He's no different than the two thieves on his sides. He's just some guy. His teachings are great. His life is great, very moral. He's like Buddha. He's like Mohammed. But he's no different. He just did this for no reason. David Hansen, I read a book in college about the, easy, the, the, the ease of pastoral ministry, of, of really not taking ministry too seriously. And this quote comes from that book. David Hansen says, The resurrection of Jesus is, among other things, God's specific vindication of Jesus' earthly teachings and life. It justifies who Jesus says he is. 
everything the scriptures say, everything the scriptures teach, because Jesus rose from the dead, it teaches the truth of who he is because he rose from the dead. I want to give a, a picture for us. I've got the pleasure, had the pleasure of preaching and teaching on the sacrificial system, at Day of Atonement, the temple, all those things. It's, it's probably one of my most exciting because all the pictures that are there of who Jesus is are, are, are it, it kinda, I, I kind of get excited right now. I don't want to just go off track and start talking about the temple and how Jesus is all throughout that, but I won't. But on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, there was this, 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 this act that the high priest would go into the holy place, the most holy place, excuse me. And he would actually go in for his sins and the sins of the people. And he would take two goats. The first goat, he would lay his hands on and pray. And they would take that goat outside of the gates and let it run. And it was actually symbolic of the sins leaving the camp, leaving the people of God. The other goat, well, that goat wasn't so lucky because its light, light throat got sliced, blood all over the place, all over the, the altar, but all over the priest also. And they would burn it. And he would take that blood into the Holy of Holies into the place where only God dwells, where only the high priest could go once a year, and he would put it on the mercy seat. He would put it on the kipper of God. He would put it on the atonement seat. But the funny thing is, he would go in with bells on. It's like that whole saying, I'll be there with bells on. But he would also go with a rope. Because if, his sacrifice, if the sacrifice was not acceptable, if the lamb that was given and sacrificed was not acceptable to God, the high priest would die in the, high, in the most holy place. And they would have to drag him out. And I, I, I love that picture, not because I'm hoping some priest died. But the picture it gives us is that Christ, because he rose from the dead, was accepted by God that he lived a perfect life, he died a sinless life, he rose from the grave, he ascended to the Father, and he awaits to usher in his kingdom. This new heaven and new earth that Scripture talks about, that's because Jesus rose from the dead. That's because he said who he said he was. He is who he said he was, excuse me. The Gospels talk about this importance also. Luke specifically says, See at my hands that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones that you see I, that I have. That you see that I have, excuse me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all touch on the resurrection and how Christ rose from the dead, was shown to people, had a physical body. It's of very theological importance. Even the Psalms, the Old Testament, say you will not abandon my body to Sheol nor let your Holy One see corruption. Through this truth of the resurrection, we are born into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperished, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in this last time. The resurrection is more than just a theological belief. It is here, it is now, it is a hope. For those of you that were actually here last week, I came a few minutes or a few minutes late because um, I was preaching out in Walnut and dropped my wife off at home because the baby was fussy 
and then I came over here real quick, so I, I actually got here right at this point, was Christine was giving Albert's sermon, which um, I learned about later on, but she did a pretty good job, actually, in my opinion. I don't think I could have done that well of a job. But she said that, that, the, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen, and that we walk by faith, not by sight. She didn't quote him back to back, but I am. She used a verse that talks about we live by faith in Christ and who he says he is, and we walk by that faith. And if that faith is assurance of things hoped for, we hope in the resurrection. Therefore, because we hope in the resurrection, we have an assurance, and we walk in that assurance. That we don't just believe this lofty theological idea. Now, in my opinion, we must believe it because it's so strongly talked about in the Gospels and in Scripture all over in the epistles. But it's something that's, that's living. It's an assurance that is alive. It's an assurance that is for here and now. We have a living hope. It's alive, it's living, it's active. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Assurance of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have a hope through the resurrection. It's the action of the indwelling Christ of those who follow him. The action, the very, the very work of Christ brings hope. It's not because we believe something that, 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 that we might hope is true. It's because we believe something we know is true. That's the word assurance there. Peter goes on to say in his letter a little bit later in chapter 2 that we, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You being like living stones, Christ's the chief cornerstone, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy, sanctified, set-apart priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices because of the hope of the resurrection, we live completely different. We live sacrificially. Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12. It's not something that's stagnant. It's not like just a puddle laying on the floor and you just see flies all around it. It's river, it's, it's a living water. You know, we want to be that river church. We want to go and spread among the nations, locally and globally. Just as Jesus Christ rose from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in a newness of life. And that's where the resurrection comes into application, if you will. For sin is not our master. It's where, where you, 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 when you look at Romans 6, and we hear of, Ro of 1 Peter and 1 Corinthians and, and all these other passages, that there is this unifying agent of us to Christ that we are in a likeness of his through his death and his resurrection. Romans 6, 4, and 5 says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, 
in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we have been unified with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. I don't know, but I don't know about you, but but that's the unifying factor. That two become one. It's 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 actually the same language that is used of marriage in Genesis. It's the same language that is used in being the like in the, made in the image and likeness of God. It's the same exact language. It's two things becoming one, having equality in that one thing. We were buried with him by baptism into death. We are immersed into Christ's death so that while being raised in it, it is like his resurrection also. The language that Paul uses is one of likeness. Like I said, Genesis and uh, 1 and 2. God's image, the imagio Dei, the image of God, and also the marriage picture that we get. The word united means planted together, born together with, or of joint origin. It's, 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 it's that... That, that picture, it, it's really a planting picture. It's really taking two different things and grafting them together and they go and actually make a new plant or, or make a plant, but of two different roots, of two separate root systems of joint origin planted together. The word likeness means image, equality, or identity, or resemblance. The word baptism means to immerse, very simply. We are immersed in the death of Christ. That's why he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. He gives an imagery of death. He gives language of death. It's a likeness language all throughout Scripture in various ways and forms. Even in Galatians, he says, for all of you who are baptized to Christ have put on Christ or clothed yourself with Christ. This is why Jesus uses such language as dying to live and living to die. I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. And he whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He just is in the process of raising Lazarus from the dead after being dead four days. Second Corinthians 5, old has passed away, the new has come. More language, likeness, likeness language, excuse me. And, and I'm repeating myself because there is such importance to know that Christ died, we die by faith. Christ lives, we live by faith. It, it's the, the Second Corinthians passage, it actually gives... And it speaks of taking that which is old and bringing it back to that which it was originally created for. We're actually by faith and belief in Jesus going back to that which God created us before we fell. That's the image, that's the wording he's giving us of this ministry of reconciliation he's talking about there. We see the importance of the resurrection. Theologically, we have a hope. And we walk in a newness of life. That we walk in something that is totally different. That is why it is so important that when the world, when Jesus says that they will know you by your love, they will know that you are my disciples by your love, but it is different.
and, and, and I'm going to touch on this, and, and, and I kind of feel the spirit prompting me that I think too often we actually are more sad and sorrowful and mad and angry than those that don't believe in Jesus. I think non-believers are actually better Christians than we are sometimes. And I've seen it. I've actually been a worse Christian sometimes than those that call themselves atheists. My wife's cousin's husband, straight up atheist. He believes people that are Christians, they, they lean on a crutch. He doesn't need a crutch, he doesn't need God. He's actually a really good dad, though. Believes in family, believes in, in, in love, all those things. And sometimes he's actually a better person than I am. Openly admit that. But that's something that I need to change. Whatever that looks like. I'm not going to get into details. But just the overall importance that, that sometimes just it is. And I think that's one of the big issues that we have in the church is they're better Christians than we that are Christians are. Because I think that we're doing the Christian thing sometimes, but we're not doing the Christ-like thing. Anybody ever walked around their house and you see a fly go zipping past you? I actually just had this happen to me this past week, which is maybe why I thought about this. But, and you're like, oh, I gotta get the fly swatter. You go grab it and you follow it and you see it and you track it and whack! Flies dead, boop, it gets up and flies away. You gotta track it down again. I want to say that, that, that we too often live, and this touches on where I just went with non-Christians live better sometimes than Christians, is that we live as though we are still dead and we can't get up and fly away. That we actually, through the resurrection, are still alive. We are not dead. Uh, church I worked at in New York, the, the pastor son once described hell to me, and I asked him really quick, and he was like, I think 10 years old at the time, 12 years old. He's now actually married and lives in Washington, I think, or Oregon. Really cool little kid in the band, skateboarder, but just loves Christ. And he said, he's like, going to hell is like death without dying. So to me, being a Christian and following Christ is life without dying. Because even though we physically are, we actually do go six feet under, there is that resurrection, Paul says. There is that hope. But if we live in this died mentality, this death, this, you know, like a fly that's been swatted mentality. We live in defeat. We live actually where the devil and sin wants us to be, lying on the ground. Because I think that's our problem. Too often we think that God and the devil are in the arm wrestling match. But the problem is, the devil only has his power because God is all-powerful. The devil only has his power and strength because God allows it. I'm, I just can't picture that, that, you know, Jesus in his man bun. <laughs> There's no better picture. I couldn't find anything. It's like, it's like a, a, you know, a, a Jesus with a man bun. I just, you know, hey, whatever. <laughs> Go with it. But... The point being is that this is not true. This is theologically wrong, in my opinion, because the devil's not wrestling God. He thinks he is. He thinks this is going on, but God's just like, dude, come on, really? Seriously? You think that I'm like, I'm going to get beat by you? 
The devil's in a fallen angel. God is the creator of the angels. Ta-da! Problem solved. But too often we live as that dead fly. Too often we live an unvictorious life. It's, it's, it's a, a, theo, a Latin term that I love called Christus Victor, Christ the Victorious One. It's a Latin, a, a Lutheran theology primarily. Actually, I didn't know, but up until 400 years ago, Abner helped fill me in that it was lost. And then the whole substitutionary atonement came in, and that was the focus among, you know, most churches for the past few hundred years. But for 1,400 years, when they thought of the cross and the resurrection, they thought that Jesus won. They knew that Jesus won. They didn't live as the dead fly. They got up and flew away. I think, though, there's two passages. I'm going I'm to leave this up. There's two passages I want to read Exodus 14, 13 through 14 says, fear not. I mean, I'm going to actually give you a little background real quick. The, the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, and they're coming up to the Red Sea, and they're stuck there. And they look at Moses saying, what are we going to do? Oh, the Egyptians are behind us. Got to give up. God says to Moses, Moses says to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. All they had to do is sit and wait. Christus Victor, Christ the Victorious One. That's the beauty of the resurrection of this theological thought we have, that we have victory in Christ Jesus our Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 says. That we have a blessed hope, a living hope. And we are unified in that hope. We are unified in that resurrection. We die like Christ. We are resurrected like Christ. Here and now and yet to come here and to come. So we will actually get a new body. We will get a glorified body, and that is amazing. And I can't wait to see some of you, because all our theology is going to be corrected in some way, shape, or form. But we get that, and we get to do that, because we walk by faith and not by sight, and we live in assurance of that faith because we have hope, because of who Christ is. This wrestling match, I want to say a lot of times, and I'm going to say a few last things, and, and we'll kind of close up. At least my end will close up. But I think sometimes that we live in fear. That we have this fear that binds us, that if we let go, we won't have control. That if we let go, we won't actually understand. And I know for me that's a big one. That if I let go and I don't have the correct theology, I'm going to be wrong. And I'm not going to dot, dot, dot. I'm big on studying scripture. It's, it's, it's the way I connect to God the clearest. The way I collect, connect to people clearest also is when I talk about God and things of, of creation and, and so on and so forth. But if we sit and dwell in fear, we can't actually stand risen and victorious in Christ. That's the problem. But take note, perfect love casts out fear. And I think that's one of the biggest deals is knowing who we are in Christ. 
knowing who God has called us to be, that you are beloved and you are his child and you are adopted. You are perfect in his eyes because of what Christ did. And I know we're going to go into a time of contemplation. But I'm going to close this in a a short prayer real quick, and then we'll kind of move into that. Father, Father, help this, this theology to be in our hearts, to be a sanctifying agent, to cast out fear, to to bring in love, to walk as children of the light in what is good and right and true. And as we, we go into this time of contemplation, prepare our hearts. Prepare what you want to say to us. Prepare our ears and our minds and our hearts to, to come and meld And hear from you, Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Aaron. Um, There there are a few things that Aaron said that that really stuck out to me. Uh, The most significant one, I think, was you you had a line there, Aaron, when you said, uh, we don't worship a dead person. Right, and that just kind of struck, stuck, stuck me, uh, struck me. Um, uh, I remember, like a lot of you guys know, I didn't, I didn't grow up in the church, right? Like I came to faith later on in life. And I think for uh, all my upbringing as, as a child, I had a lot of people kind of tell me stories about God, but I never really experienced God myself, and I, I didn't really come to faith until I was 19 years old. But I remember uh, when I came to faith when I was 19 years old at UCLA, um, what, what struck me about that, that moment was realizing that God wasn't just a word on a piece of paper or on a page, right? Like that God, that God was real. Um, and, I, and I love that, right? I, I think that the reason God becomes real in our lives is because we don't worship uh, a dead person. Um, so I, I wanted us to, to think about, like, like, like the resurrection, it's, it's, it's a highly theological thing, right? Like uh, you start talking about resurrection, resurrection, incarnation, atonement, all these things, like whew, like really big words. And sometimes I feel like we just need to kind of like, you know, bring it back down to earth. So one of the ways that I want to help you do that is to think about uh, a lot of you in here are followers of Jesus and some of you are not. But for those of you who are followers of Jesus, I want you to think about your life before you became a follower of Jesus. And I want you to think about your life now. How did that happen? What kind of hope do you feel like you, you have now? How, how were your eyes opened? Um, and I want you to share that with the person next to you. How, how did that happen for you? How did you realize that Jesus was real? So I want to go, go ahead and give us an opportunity to have conversation with each other. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, um, you can go ahead and share why you're not there. That's okay too, right? So, but, but go ahead and share with each other.
go, go ahead and finish up your conversation. So what I, what I want us to do uh, as we enter into a time of worship, Dara and the team are going to lead us uh, in a response. Um, I want you to reflect uh, as JR is playing on the things that you're grateful for and on the ways that you feel if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, uh, just reflecting and being grateful for the ways that he has resurrected you, right? Like uh, Aaron was talking about that passage in, in Romans where Paul is talking about dying with Christ and living in the hope that we will be resurrected again. I think physically that will happen, but spiritually that has happened for many of us in here. So as, as we're entering into a time of worship, I want us to, to, to reflect on that and to, to rejoice in that, right? Uh, that, that there's hope that we have because of our, our faith in Jesus. Uh, some of you all have been asking, uh, what's up with all the response times right after the sermons? And I just wanted to, to give a, a quick apologetic for that. Sometimes when you're up here speaking, you feel like the spirit is moving. And, and as, as somebody who's kind of giving the sermon, you, you, you feel like we should respond a certain way. Um, and, so, and sometimes as a worship leader, you feel like the spirit is moving also. And we all actually want to make that part of the service, right? Like we don't want 1230 to come along and then all of a sudden we, we hit the stop button or the pause on whatever it is that the spirit was doing. We actually want to continue entering into that time. So I think this is maybe new for some of us. Um, uh, and that's okay. I feel like let, let's just enter in, into what God is doing. Give give the Spirit an opportunity to just minister to people. And if that's not you, that's okay, right? But if you feel like you're getting caught up, you know, uh, that's okay also. So as we're worshiping, um, yeah, just why don't you go ahead and, and pray and, and, and thank the Lord for the things that He has given you, in particular your, your resurrected life, okay? So, Jerry, will you take it? And then at some point, Jeff will come up and lead us in communion. So let 
So here at Trinity, we practice something called open communion, and we believe that all are welcome at the table of God. Um, it is apparent in the way that Jesus treats Judas at the Last Supper. Um, not that non-Christians are traitors, but that um, everyone still has a chance, right? There's still a chance to, to live um, after being swatted. Um, and up until the end, um, Jesus still had some hope that was there for Judas to be welcomed into the kingdom of God, right? And the, the victory that we can see, the hope that we have as Christians is that we can experience heaven now, that there is victory now because what had happened at the end of time actually happened in the middle of time and we're living after the fact. We're living in the, the, the victorious period of Christ because he has conquered the grave. He has won, right? And I think that's, kind of why Aaron has been calling us to, to something a little greater. There's more hope that's there, there's happiness, there's, there should be less things like sorrow because of the fact that we're risen with Christ, right? Um, and so I'm gonna ask, we have two stations. We're gonna have one up here in the front, and we're gonna have one in the back, and West stepped out, so we'll come a little public. Here. Oh, West here, hey, sorry, you changed clothes. <laughs> 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 you changed different color. 
Um, and so Wes and I will be at the back, um, but we welcome you. We practice something called intinction here at Trinity. And what that means, not to weird you out, intinction is just a, a fancy word for dipping. So what we practice here is dipping. So we're gonna take the bread, and if you're not a follower of Christ, we ask you to take that one as well, and you can come to the table. But if you are a follower of Christ, and you want to continue professing your faith, and you claim that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior, and you've risen with Christ, then we ask that you also dip this into the juice. It's not wine, it's juice. Um, and then you take that, and then you'll receive that as well. And then from there, we'll kind of um, reflect a little bit more, and then we'll be dismissed to our communion lunch, where we continue to fellowship in that vein. All right? So with that, um, we'll just call our communion ushers to come forward, and we'll set up a station for you. if you want to continue in worship if you want um, for those of you who want to stay and continue praying 
Uh, we're going to step out, and there's actually going to be a meal. So the, the guys in Mark's study decided to take on the communion lunch today. So before we head out, let me pray for the meal real quick, and then we can continue worshiping. God, I just thank you, uh, Lord, for this morning. Lord, I thank you for uh, the short period of rain, God, that just uh, just gets rid of all the smog and everything uh, that's in the air. Lord, thank you for the change in temperature, uh, Lord, that we get to hang out outside today and have lunch. Pray a blessing over the food, Lord. Uh, thank you for, once again, everything that you give us for your blessings. Lord, I pray that we would have a great conversation around the table, Lord God, and just remembering what you've done for us and just learning how to be community together. I pray, Father, that you would be the guest of honor uh, at all of our tables this morning. So we thank you. Amen. Given all I am to seek your face. All I am is yours. My whole life found place in your hands. God of mercy, your world I bow down. Your presence at your throne And I call You answer And you came to my rescue And I want to be where you